having me. I'm always excited to be with you and I'm very grateful for our collaboration. We picked the topic today because this week we mentioned 17 years since uh, United Nations Security Council Resolution 1701 that actually ended the Second Lebanese War. According to this resolution in South Lebanon, in an area of about 20 kilometers from the Blue Line uh, until the Nitani River, in a minute I will present a map, there shouldn't be any illegal military presence. And I want to show you uh, the exact phrase of the resolution. The question of who should enforce this resolution remained open since the uh, expression and the phrasing, as you can see in the resolution, is under different interpretations. But the bottom line is, if I'm taking us to the next slide, is that the state of Israel is saying that the mandate was given to enforce the resolution, was given to UNIFIL, United Nations Interim Force to Lebanon, while most of the world is actually saying that the mandate was given to the Lebanese government, as you can see in paragraph F here, uh, to assist and UNIFIL should assist the Lebanese government enforce the resolution. The bottom line is that nobody enforced the resolution. And this is the UNIFIL map. That's the Israeli-Lebanese border over here. You can see my clicker, right? Uh, Jen, can you see my clicker? Okay. And you can see the participating countries in this force uh, as well. Today, the resolution said 15,000 soldiers. Today, these are 10,000 soldiers. Uh, and I want to discuss now what is truly happening in this area of operation of UNIFIL. In reality, nobody enforced the resolution. There are tens of thousands of rockets in South Lebanon, thousands of military operatives in the UNIFIL area of operation in a way that uh, risk and danger our security as Israelis, the stability of the state of Lebanon and the UNIFIL soldiers themselves. In the end of this month, in the end of August, this mandate will be renewed uh, in a discussion in the United Nations Security Council. Each, each year it is being renewed with, in the past few years, few corrections here and there, not too many, but that's it. And it's always the question again and again and again, whether this year people will wake up, whether in Lebanon or in Israel or in the United Nations, and actually will acknowledge the very dangerous reality here in the terrain and the ineffectiveness of UNIFIL to create a different and, and new security situation on the border between Israel and Lebanon, which this was the vision of this resolution 1701. It was not supposed to be just a regular peacekeeping force at this size, of course. It was supposed to be something different, and it was not. To understand why it was not, and, and why am I saying that it's ineffective, I want to give you some data of a report I just finished reading, 21 pages in English for an Israeli. It's quite of a challenge. And it's a report that was uh, given to the UN by, by UNIFIL, the report that was written in the UN to summarize the UNIFIL activity uh, and findings in its area of operation and also a, a kind of an overview about Lebanon itself, describing the situation between 20, uh, February 21st and 20th of June. Uh, the good news is that uh, I don't know if I should say first time, but in a very unusual way, uh, finally, the UNIFIL is saying Hezbollah, it is putting the responsibility on Hezbollah, saying that Hezbollah continuing to maintain military capabilities inside Lebanon, saying that this is a violation. Wow, I am I, I, I'm not cynical. I'm, I, clearly, when I saw this paragraph, I was thrilled. But on the other hand, uh, show you the paragraph. On the other hand, I must say that so many things are described in this report that made me, as an Israeli, do like this, saying, "Wow, this is the situation in South Lebanon now. This is not regular, and it actually reflects the 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 incompetence of Unifil to stop." And I'm just giving you numbers, you know, South Lebanon in numbers, if you like. 
So in the report, it's written that there were four incidents of uh, weapons pointing IDF against Lebanese army and vice versa. There were around 600 violations of the land border, meaning that what they call individuals in civilian attire, I'm quoting from the report, this means Hezbollah, okay? Crossed into Israel, into uh, south to the blue line. In more than 300 cases, these are described as shepherds. And I know that, that shepherds are not always innocent shepherds. In many cases, these are actually intelligence uh, operatives of Hezbollah that are gathering information. And in 230 other cases, they don't know who they are. Civilians in military, in, in, uh, individuals in civilian attire. Guys, these are Hezbollah. I see them uh, all the time on the border. And in a moment, I'll show you some photos. They're talking about uh, nine violations of the blue line of the Lebanese army itself. They are talking about uh, four individuals that were arrested by the IDF south to the blue line. They talked about an incident that uh, bullets were, were <clears throat> stolen from an IDF soldier that was working to build a wall on the blue line, south to the blue line. They are talking about 300 cases of unauthorized weapons in this area. Remember, it should be empty of any unauthorized weapons. 21 of them are not you know, it's it's kind of a culture in Lebanon to hunt. So 21 of them are not hunting weapons. These are light machine guns, assault rifles, long range rifles, pistols. Uh, eight times they identified weapons in a shooting range, which is not a Lebanese army shooting range. They saw Hezbollah flags in the shooting range and they identified actually uh, four shooting ranges in their area of operation. About 20 times there were violations of the freedom of movement of UNIFIL. So UNIFIL is saying, yes, but we have like 6,000 uh, patrols. So 20 times, it's not that much. But if you look at the reality, you understand that in many cases, UNIFIL, in, in many areas, UNIFIL is not even trying to get in because it's too dangerous. Green without border positions. This is something that, um, this is something that you should see and I want to show you. One minute. I want to show you some photos of what does that mean, green without borders positions. <clears throat> this is a position, a, a photo that I took from the border, one out of many. And Unifil is saying that there are six towers in various heights uh, on the borderline. These are green without borders is an environment organization that is registered in the Lebanese government. But actually these towers and only uh, 12 out of uh, more than 20 uh, positions on the border are having these marks of green without borders. Uh, in these towers, in 18 containers as well, we have seen Hezbollah military operatives. How do I know these are Hezbollah military operatives? See for yourself, this person is standing on the position. He's taking photos of me once I was standing there with a the group. Uh, this person is wearing uniforms, he's wearing a mask, he's probably uh, special forces, commando forces of Hezbollah. He just popped out of the bushes when I was standing with the group. Uh, this is the border of the fence. Uh, this person is wearing uniforms, he's taking photos of me, you get the picture. So Unifil is saying there are 18 uh, containers. This is a, an example for the containers. By the way, this specific container is placed at the kidnapping point of 2006, where these two soldiers were kidnapped. And afterwards, this was the reason that Israel actually, uh, for, for the second war with Lebanon. Um, and you can see the, the poster of Green Without Borders on the container. So 18 containers, six watching towers, uh, 19 what they call vantage point, uh, which is probably the photographer like this, it's, it's a, a, a place where you usually, when you go there, you see the photographer. And this is Hezbollah kind of everywhere we go. The UNIFIL is saying that in some of these places, there, was, there were limitations of the freedom of movement. What does that mean? It means that when they try to, to, to come near to these positions, they were blocked, stoned, their cameras were taken, 
and they, they were not enabling some of the, okay, in one of the occasions, it was a container next to a Unifil position, so Unifil couldn't even approach to the position. In some of these infrastructures, the Unifil saw a CCTV uh, cameras, these are not environment organizations. This is a civilian cover for Hezbollah military activity on our border, and UNIFIL understands that. Another very interesting thing, UNIFIL find out for what they called opening in the ground. Guys, I want to remind everybody, a few years ago, Israel found border crossing tunnels from Lebanon into Israel, and now UNIFIL saw from above, from the helicopter that they fly above uh, South Lebanon, four openings in the ground, three very small, uh, next to it there were drilling equipment, and a, another one, uh, another big one, and these were all not far from the border. And UNIFIL is saying very clearly, even though the, uh, there were many requests from the Lebanese army, remember, uh, everybody says that UNIFIL should assist the Lebanese army carry out, carry out the resolution, enforce the resolution. So though many requests from the Lebanese army for full approach to these areas, including the positions of green without borders, the tunnels that I've just mentioned, the tunnels from 2019, those YDF already exposed. Uh, the openings are inside Lebanon. Everybody knows where the openings are. Uh, for shooting ranges to all these places, the Lebanese army denied the access from Unifil. Unusual incident, they are talking on a small grenade that was thrown uh, towards the uh, IDF that was busy in building the wall there. Uh, they are talking about um, a tent. Let's talk about the tent for a moment. Uh, Hezbollah in, in, in the beginning of May planted two tents south of the, the blue line in an area named Shiba Farms. I'll show you a map in a minute. Uh, but what I learned from the report for the first time is that actually these tents are positioned in a place that it was uh, close to Unifil position and it uh, prevented Unifil from approaching to its position. So eventually one tent was removed. Uh, they saw CCTVs uh, in these tents. They said they saw these tents are manned. IDF published photos that these men are armed, but Unifil didn't relate to that. Unifil requested from the Lebanese army to remove the tents. One is went down, the other one is still there, as far as we know. Uh, the report, as I've said, is talking about the situation in Lebanon in general, and they talk about a, a military training that was carried out a few months ago in Lebanon, not in the UN area of operation, that actually exemplified the military capabilities of Hezbollah against Israel. It was published all over. We also wrote about it. It is actually a violation of another UN Security Council decision, 1559, that was issued after the Hariri assassination and called to the among some other stuff to the disarmament of uh, Hezbollah. Um, I want to show you a video uh, of another uh, of another uh, training of another training of Unifil. There we are. Uh, of another training of Hezbollah. 30 second video that we that was published in the TV in South Lebanon. Okay, can you see that? Okay, what you see in the video, it looks like uh, these are Hezbollah military operatives, but if you look at their guns here, you will see these are paint pond guns. It looks very funny. Um, it's just, they are just playing. But actually it's not exactly like that. If you see the Jeep, now somebody is pushing somebody to the Jeep. This is training for kidnapping and he has a real Kalachnikov. He is the real guy that we're interested in. Uh, this training, you see the flags, Hezbollah yellow flag, Palestinian flag. Uh, this training is next to a UN position. Guys, when I stand on the border with your groups, I see this UN position, okay? It's just around, it's less than 100 meters from me. So the training took place on the Israeli-Lebanese position next to a Unifil, and it is not even mentioned in the report. Um, what can I say? Clearly, from the report, from everything I presented, the situation is very tense. I want to, but but everybody is talking. If if you read a little bit in the newspaper about Israeli-Lebanese border, everybody is talking about provocation. This is the term that is now being used. Hezbollah is making provocations. There are provocations, provocations. Look, 
when I celebrate a Jewish Passover at home and I have uh, 36 rockets above my home, this is not provocation. This is a terrorist attack, okay? A month earlier than this incident, there was an infiltrator that crossed from Lebanon uh, into Israel, succeeded in uh, going all the way down 80 kilometers from the border and he was carrying a lot of explosives with him and he planted them and he failed to kill many Israelis as he planned and he was caught on his way back. This is not a provocation. This is a well-planned terrorist attack uh, ended up eventually with one Israeli wounded. And last month, two anti-tank missiles were launched to Rajar, uh, which is a, an Israeli town on the border. Uh, luckily, again, nobody was hurt. There are some reports that these missiles target was an IDF patrol uh, on the fence. This is not a provocation. This is an attack. Terrorist attack or not, it is an attack. So actually what I'm saying is that in the past two years, we understand that Hezbollah wants escalation. Maybe Hezbollah even wants war. We don't know exactly. But we understand that Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, is willing to take more risks on the blue line to bring achievements to Lebanon. Uh, I can say a year ago with the maritime border dispute, and I'm not going to get to all the details about the maritime border dispute, uh, Nasrallah said it's either an agreement or a war, and Israel made a concession, and we got an agreement, we got the gas, that's the good news. The bad news is that we, we made a bad message to Hezbollah that it works. If we, you threaten war in Israel, there will be concessions. Um, and eventually, and by the way, within a few months, we will know whether there is gas in the Lebanese side as well. I hope they, I, I truly hope they. Now what we see is that Nasrallah is uh, trying to get achievements on the uh, land border as well. And I want to explain what I've just said. This is very important. When Israel had withdrawn from Lebanon, uh, the United Nations acknowledged the withdrawal, the Israeli withdrawal from Lebanon, but the Lebanese said, no, we have reservations, which are marked in red in my map. We have reservations, areas, meters, by the way. It's, it's meters, sometimes tens of meters, that's it. Uh, these are areas that we don't think that uh, Israel had withdrawn from and the UN marked the border in the wrong place. One of these locations is the one that you see in the photo, which is a town named Raja. Remember the anti-tank missiles? They were launched at this town. This is a town that if you look at the blue line, the UN marked the border when we had withdrawn in the middle of the town. It means that out of 3,000 uh, Arab, by the way, Arab citizens of Israel living in this town, half of them are now, one morning they found out they live in Lebanon. This is how they tell the story, by the way. Uh, they are saying we are not Lebanese, we have an Israeli citizenship, and if ever, we are Syrians. Why do they say we are Syrians? And this is a complicated issue, but I want, I want to talk about it. You see the, the, the black line in my map, okay? This area, including this town, was taken from Syria along with the Golan in 1967. And that's why they are either Syrians or Israelis, but they are definitely not Lebanese. So this is what they're saying. Nobody exactly understand how the border was marked in the middle of the town. There are different versions of that. The bottom line is, Hezbollah is saying very clearly, you want us to take off the tent? No problem. Uh, uh, stay out of Raja. Withdraw from Raja. Now, it is clear to everybody here that this is impossible. It's a humanitarian issue. And the next day, if we will withdraw from Raja, these people will be dead. As simple as that. Nobody is going to spare them. <clears throat> what Nasrallah is saying today, uh, either you withdraw from all these places, marked in, in red in my map, or I'm going to uh, attack. He's not saying war this time, but he's saying I'm going to attack. Uh, he had a speech two days ago. In his speech, he said, yes, I know. Uh, your defense minister, Israeli defense minister, minister threatened that uh, Lebanon we will, we will go back to the Stone Age if Hezbollah will do something. I want to tell something to the Israelis. Israel will go back to the Stone Age as well. Guys, look how this person thinks. He doesn't care if Lebanon will go back to the Stone Age. He's saying, okay, let, let us both be back to the Stone Age. This is actually what he's saying. Um, by the end of the month, as I've said, the Security Council in the UN is going to vote for the renewal of the mandate. 
What we see is another trend that is developing, that the Lebanese are trying to limit the independence of the force, meaning a campaign is being made that UNIFIL cannot patrol by themselves alone, only with the Lebanese army. By the way, already today, they cannot patrol without the Lebanese army permission, meaning that all the routes of the patrols are being confirmed by the Lebanese army. You can understand what does that mean. Uh, in any case, from all the data that I've just given you, pretty a lot of data, you understand that it's ineffective. And even as a peacekeeping force, uh, UNIFIL failed to even prevent the attacks against Israel. What is my what is my key message? My key message is go slim. What do I mean by go slim? We have 10,000 soldiers uh, in South Lebanon. In times of war, it is clear to me, Hezbollah will use them as human shields. You saw the training next to the UNIFIL position. It means that in the next war, Hezbollah will launch from the UNIFIL position or next to the UNIFIL position. That's why I think, and, I, and I'm saying that completely as an Israeli, I think that 10,000 soldiers, it's, it's too much of a risk for these soldiers without any uh, you know, physical achievement. And that's why I, I prefer to have a small force that will be very effective in moderating tactical disputes uh, on the border. Uh, I, I said there were around 600 crossings of the blue line. UNIFIL was there in many of these cases to, to talk with both sides. Uh, it didn't prevent the crossing, but it, it was there to lower the tensions. It will not prevent war, but it can it can prevent an escalation that nobody wanted. And as, and as I've said, now there is at least one side that is interested in escalation. That's, that's why I'm saying. Bottom line, for moderating tactical issues on the fence between the soldiers themselves, between civilians, uh, problems here and there, we need an international force. But we can satisfy it with a few hundreds. We don't need 10,000 soldiers for that. It will risk their lives for us. Um, maybe we can stop here. I don't know. What do you say, Jen? Let's do it. I know we have a ton of questions coming in. And Sarit, that was, as always, an incredibly insightful and detailed overview. Um, I'm asking everyone to please raise their hand in the hand raise function or send me a message on the chat. I want to take it back, sort of looking at the big picture geopolitically, because once we get before we get into the minutia again, where are we with who is controlling whom in Syria and Lebanon? Obviously, we've learned from many Zooms from you in the past and previous visits up north that you have the Iranian proxy running Lebanon, running Syria, but also looking right now at sort of the Russian vacuum, if there is a Russian vacuum. Russia obviously was one of the people that kept President al-Assad in office, and we know that Syria and Lebanon were sort of working in tandem. He's clearly busy, Putin's clearly busy in the Ukraine. And I'm curious kind of geopolitically right now, who is running each country and where is the UN in terms of tempering any of that before we get back into the minutia? Let's talk numbers. I'm sorry, I'm a person of details. We love uh, that. <laughs> as far as I know, uh, and, and I'm not an expert to the war in Ukraine, uh, the, the Russians in Ukraine, uh, it's uh, around 100,000 soldiers, Russian soldiers are involved there, right? Yep, in about. Syria, in Syria, before the war in Ukraine and after the war in Ukraine, we are talking on, on 10,000 soldiers, 10,000 Russian soldiers before the war in Ukraine and 9,000 Russian soldiers after the war in Ukraine. Meaning that for Russia to preserve its presence in Syria and only to uh, decline it a little bit, uh, it's not a big cost. It's not a big problem. So there were some forces that were manu uh, transferred to Ukraine, but it was very little. We've seen some positions that were abandoned, but it is very little. There is influence of Ukraine on Syria and the region in general, though. What do I mean? I talk about the balance of power. Meaning that I can say again, person of details, before the, the war in Ukraine, we could see like examples of the Russians making sure that the Iranians are not, we are saying in Hebrew, going between their legs. Meaning that there is kind of a competition between Iran and, and Russia on over Syria. 
And we saw like in South Syria, next to the Israeli border, it was clear that the Russians are trying to be more involved. By the way, not only with military aspects, but also with civilian aspects, like humanitarian aid to the population. This is very important if you want to control for a long time in, in an area. Uh, after the war in Ukraine, we see things are a little bit different. There is a status quo in Syria. They share the hunt, okay? <laughs> some areas are for Iran, some areas are for Russians, and you don't see the competition anymore. And I think this is the main difference that Ukraine created. Another thing, now, why? how come? It's not because Russia is busy in Ukraine. It's because Russia is getting military assistance from Iran. It's funny to say it, but it is what it is. Iran is providing uh, UAVs to Russia, and these UAVs are attacking in Ukraine. And that's why for Russia it was an interest. I guess this is how it was, uh, it was paying to Iran by uh, uh, com complying with the status quo in Syria. So understanding all of that right now, obviously there is a serious power vacuum in Lebanon. The, you know, there's a vacuum of a president, Hezbollah is de facto running the country and the UN is sitting back and clearly from your presentation, tacitly overseeing this without doing very much while Lebanon is in a severe economic collapse. What is the, the best outcome from Lebanon in this situation? How does it sort of emerge from these ashes, so to speak, and become, a, I don't even want to say an ally to Israel, but really create a cold peace where there isn't that much hostility going forward? Is that even possible? Uh, I once read a, 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 an incredible article. I can't remember the name of the expert who wrote it, but it, it was pretty famous who said the title of the article was uh, Americans Stop Solutionizing the Middle East. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see a solution. I'm saying that sadly, I feel it in my stomach when I'm saying that because I live here, but I don't see a solution for Lebanon uh, other than, and I, I'm not sure it's a solution, but other than the scenario that the government in Iran will, will change. Uh, and even with this, it's not going to solve the problems of Lebanon tomorrow. Morning. Okay, it, it, will, it will be a process and it will take time. Uh, eventually, Israel has a conflict to manage rather than to solve. And if I'm talking about the dilemmas that were the Israeli government was facing in the past few months, how to retaliate to rocket launching, extreme rocket launching against Israel in a holiday, and how to uh, respond to the tents that are actually uh, south to the blue line and to all these provocations that I've just described. And many Israelis said Israel should take a very harsh position. Israel should uh, send a clear message to Hezbollah. And the Israeli government was very, very cautious. Uh, the messages were with wording. But if we talk about deeds, you didn't see the Israeli government attacking Hezbollah positions all of a sudden. It didn't happen. Uh, and I think that eventually this is conflict management. Again, you can criticize it, but you can definitely understand the dilemma between how do you uh, create, how do you keep the conflict limited as, as much as possible, even though the other side wants to escalate it. And on the other hand, how do you avoid sending the wrong message to the other side? And how do you uh, prevent, you know, we, we cannot 100% prevent these, these, these attacks. It is clear to us, by the way, as Israel. So how do you send a message that, you know, uh, will will make them understand that it's not profitable for them? And it's a huge dilemma. And I'm not sure we found a way. I'm I'm telling you, uh, I'm not sure we found a way. You heard Nasrallah, which is saying yes, Lebanon will go back to the Stone Age, okay, but Israel will go back to the Stone Age as, as well. He doesn't care. Mutually assured destruction, I think, is the sort of colloquial term of how to put it. So knowing all of this, and obviously Lebanon has been rife with civil war for so, quite some time, where is the population on this? We have a question that I'm going to read it out loud. Considering the terrible economic situation in Lebanon, there's been speculation that there is a substantial population who wants to join the Abraham Accords. Obviously, this is optimistic. If Israel can eliminate the Hezbollah threats in the south, which will substantially reduce the influence that Iran has in Lebanon, would this be feasible, especially knowing that the Gulf Arabs would clearly be thrilled to have an ally in the, in this fight? Is that a realistic outcome? What is Lebanon? 
to answer it, we both know, right? What is Lebanon? <laughs> what is Lebanon? Who are the Lebanese? This is the biggest question. By the way, it's a question mark. It's uh, you know, what are who are the Lebanese? The Lebanese are Hezbollah. Many, I don't know. Many Lebanese are against Hezbollah. I can't even say the numbers. We know there are about four and a half million citizens of Lebanon. Maybe a million or two more uh, Syrian refugees. Who are these citizens of Lebanon? Due to American assessments, half of them are Muslim Shiites. Today, we don't see meaning, uh, I wouldn't say meaning, strong opposition within the Shiite population of Lebanon against Hezbollah. Even the second party, the second Shiite party in Lebanon, in elections, they ran together. We see Hezbollah gradually taking over every system in Lebanon. So even if there are Lebanese that are interested in what was just said in relationship, whatever, Abraham Accords with Israel, these Lebanese are not in the key positions today to make any change. Lebanon today is, is it doesn't have a president. The government is not an elected government because they couldn't create a coalition. Um, the Hezbollah is a member of the Lebanese parliament and the Lebanese government. One of the main positions in the government is taken by Hezbollah. This is the Minister for Pro Public Works or Transportation. It sounds like nothing. He's responsible for all the entrances and exits of Lebanon. This, this means that all these weapons that is coming into Lebanon, uh, is he, he's approving that. He's enabling that. He puts the Hezbollah in, in key positions around it. In Hariri Airport, and in the land uh, border crossing where a truck probably, we don't know for sure, crossed from Syria just last week. There was a road accident in the middle of a Christian town. What happened following that? You saw cross shooting between Hezbollah and the Christians in the town. It's not a civil war. Nobody's speaking about a civil war after this incident. We checked that in the social media. And, and Hezbollah is, is there. Hezbollah is not only in South Lebanon. Hezbollah is in South Lebanon, in areas of Beirut, and in the Baca Valley, uh, areas where Shiites are living. And that's why to talk about people in Lebanon that are interested in the Abraham Accord, I would love to speak with them, but I'm not sure they have enough power inside Lebanon to create this change. Absolutely. So I wanna go, since you mentioned this attack in the Christian town, I wanna read a question I just got in the chat and forgive my pronunciation. After the Khaled Christian town incident, a truck full of arms heading to the southern Palestinian camp of Ain El Helwe overturned and Christians and Hezbollah fought with arms. Uh, Nasrallah threatened Lebanese Christians in Israel. Can these threats be em empty threats? Can Hezbollah profit from the lack of president vacuum and show his bravado and strength to send missile missiles towards Israel and facilitate and give opportunity to Palestinians to do so? And by the same token, scare the Lebanese Christians, and where are the Druze in all of this, and how are they reacting? So if somebody had a question. Druze, uh, I'll start from the end. The Druze are uh, taking care of the Druze. So if uh, this truck didn't drive through the Druze area, it's not their business. Very simple. Okay, when uh, Hezbollah launched rockets from a Druze area in May 2021, and the Druze arrested the launcher, arrested the military operative who, who launched these rockets and made sure that he will never come back to this area. By the way, they handed him to the Lebanese army who afterwards let him go, including the rockets and the launcher. Uh, so that's about the Druze. Uh, I am not sure that the ammunition was heading to Enel Khilwe. This was in social media. Uh, we don't know exactly where it came from and where it, this is heading, but definitely there is a collaboration and there is involvement of Hezbollah in areas which it's not obviously to find it. In the refugee camps, we see Hezbollah was involved. By the way, there was there were fightings inside El Enel Khilwe just before this incident, uh, severe fightings with casualties as well between Fatah and Islamic uh, Jihad groups, and Hezbollah was the moderator trying to stop. Hezbollah is providing humanitarian aid in these areas, and also, by the way, humanitarian aid in uh, Sunni areas, such as Sidon, and Hezbollah was involved in the mediation, meaning that, yes, Hezbollah is trying to create contacts, and we've seen also meetings this week of Hezbollah with the head of the Islamic Jihad, uh, of Nasrallah, with the head of the Islamic Jihad just this week, and these meetings, by the way, are happening, it's not an unusual meeting, it is happening a lot, we do see collaboration, 
All of that, I think, it's part of the Iranian vision to create a multi-front war against Israel, from Lebanon, from Syria, from West Bank, etc. Uh, did they succeed? Not yet, but it's an ongoing war. So before we get to Iran, and I know there are a lot of questions on that, um, what are the estimate for numbers of missiles in, in Lebanon right now, approximately? Mm. It's a good question. I have a slide, but it will take me half a minute to find it. So bear with me for a moment. I can show you the numbers uh, as we as we believe they are. While you're sharing that, we have another question from uh, Ron Ukashi in the chat. Uh, what at best is UNIFIL's role in the area of operations, given that it's clearly unwilling to, and unable to fulfill its mandate? The negative aspect of their presence is quite clear, but do they play any positive role in your estimation? I'm gonna compound that with another question. Where are the French? Obviously, they were in charge of Lebanon for a, a long time. They have a lot of influence in the UN. Where did they go in all of this? The French are there. Um, if I'm going back to the map here, I have a map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a minute, we'll see the map. Da 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 da. And uh, if I'm going back to the map here, so French is also participated, except France. France, the uh, many years ago decided not to have an area under its responsibility, but it's a quick reaction force. Uh, but you can see there are Italian forces, uh, Spanish forces, uh, Irish forces as well. If I'm China, Poland, Finland, if I'm talking about European forces as well. Um, to the question of a positive role of UNIFIL, yeah, I think UNIFIL is having a positive role. And that's why I said that I don't want it out completely. <laughs> Even though sometimes, uh, you know, if, I, if I'm thinking from my heart rather than from my brain, uh, I'm saying, okay, let them out and that's it. But no, you know, uh, about... Um, I can talk about one one example, okay? Uh, the tunnels. When we were searching for the tunnels, we were walking on the Israeli side of the border, but sometimes north to the fence. Uh, there are Israeli territories north to the fence, and Unifil was there to make sure that there wouldn't be any clashes between Israeli soldiers and Lebanese army. Hezbollah was there as well. Unifil, Unifil was there to calm things down, and it was the, the work with UNIFIL around the tunnels was, ve was very effective. So as I've said, I think that with calming down uh, tactical issues uh, on the borderline, yes, UNIFIL is effective in this. But if somebody wants to launch anti-tank missiles from South Lebanon, he will do that and UNIFIL will not be able to prevent that, for example. So just to follow up on the wall, we have a question from Kerry. Um, is the wall slash barrier completed? If not, when do you think it will be? And why is Nasrallah reporting about various issues in Israel? And is he trying to prove that he knows what's going on here? What is his agenda? Nasrallah knows exactly what's going on. And yes, most of the borderline between Israel and, and Lebanon until a year and a half ago, like almost all of it, was fenced. Now you are America. Small fence, rusty fence, old fence, not very impressive fence, a fence that, that I don't know, you can just climb on. You know, when you see this fence, you say, okay, is this a border of tension? How come? And then Israeli government decided to build a wall. Actually, it took it a few years to allocate the budgets. And when we got the budgets, you see an intensified working on this wall every day. I see more and more parts of the wall being brought, brought to the border and being uh, built over there uh, on the border. Evaluation, and it's really a rough evaluation. I think that at least 30% of the border today is already walled. Uh, it's a border of more than 100 kilometers, around 110, 120 kilometers. Great. Um just looking right now, everyone is asking me about Israel attacking Iran uh, by proxy of Lebanon. What is the probability of that happening? What is best case scenario for Israel? You mentioned earlier, you know, containment, not, you know, collaboration. What is the optimal outcome look like for you? And is it likely that we're going to see this type of, in you know, proxy war go on with Lebanon with Israel taking the first hit? No, Israel is not uh, interested in taking the first hit. 
that I think from our policy until now, with everything I've just described and we didn't do anything, or we did very, very little, it means that we are not interested in taking the first hit. Uh, I'll tell you something. Yesterday I was interviewed to some kind of a TV channel and we talked about the chemical weapon uh, that uh, Syria is manufacturing and th that there is an option that it also ended up in the hands of Hezbollah. And I was asked whether, you know, is there a preemptive attack in this context of a chemical weapon in the hands of Hezbollah? It's, it's a good question. I, I don't know, as a simple Israeli, I'll put it this way, I don't know what exactly the red lines that were drawn in the Israeli cabinet meeting a few weeks ago. But somebody probably made a, a structure of, of uh, pros and cons, of uh, scenarios, of, the, of if this will happen, we'll do that, and if this will happen, we'll do that, et cetera. So I don't, but I don't think the, the scenario is going to a preemptive war. I don't think that for now, uh, even when we speak about Netanyahu and the internal situation in Lebanon, in Israel, uh, Netanyahu, it, it won't be with his, within his interest because immediately Israelis will say, you're going to, to a preemptive attack deliberately. So even if it will be justified, it will be difficult to convince Israelis. Guys, you must understand, going to a preemptive attack, it means uh, casualties, either civilian or soldiers in Israel. And we don't like that. We'll, we will go to war if necessary, if we will feel that there is no other way. And, and again, Hezbollah is trying to drag us into this situation. No question about that. And then, you know, not to make this political, but I think people are wondering, do you believe that if there are changes in the status quo of the government, you know, this government dissolves in Israel and an opposition government comes in, that there will be the same attitude towards uh, containment uh, towards Lebanon or whatever that looks like? Do you see any deviation in defense policy or are most people sort of status quo as to where they stand on these border issues? Well, I believe that if there will be changes, they will be in the details, in the small details rather than the global strategy. Eventually, the strategy of, of not deteriorating into war, postponing the war as much as possible, I believe that Gantz, Lapid, Netanyahu are all at the same page in this. If you're asking a, a question uh, about whether Lapid or Gantz would have taken the tent and you know, instead of going to the diplomatic uh, path, it, it's an option whether Netanyahu uh, would make different decisions around the maritime border, I'm, I'm not even sure. Uh, eventually, when we speak of extreme scenarios, all our prime ministers want, nobody wants a war in his shift. You know what I'm saying? No question about that. And that's something that we obviously are strongly hoping for peace. I think we all are. What, what has Israel learned or what have you, what is, are your takeaways from the 2006 war that would be applicable to any type of hypothetical incursion going forward? And where would UNIFIL fall in that spectrum? How much time do you have? Uh, <laughs> books were written about the lessons from 2006 war because look what happened. Uh, most Israelis experienced a 2006 war um, as a failure. So we basically killed 600 Hezbollah military operatives, which is a big number for Hezbollah. And uh, there was a lot of destruction in Lebanon. But Israelis experienced this war as a failure. Because until the last day, Hezbollah continued to launch rockets to Israel. And there were casualties among the army. So now, and, and when we speak about the performance of the IDF, we were not satisfied enough. When we speak about the decision-making process in the government, it was not good enough. The first thing we have learned is that the IDF must be prepared for war. The IDF in 2006 was not prepared enough. We are never prepared enough, but it was very busy in West Bank. I feel bad saying that because IDF today is also very busy in West Bank. But the IDF today is very different from what it used to be. First intelligence, uh, the technology, completely changed. Intelligence completely changed. We know much better than we used to about where the rockets are. Second, uh, collaboration between different forces, air force to ground force, to intelligence, to special forces. All of that is something that is uh, 
conducted today in a different way. And of course, there were a lot of drills and exercises throughout the years to bring the army to a different place. Um, whether the government learned the lesson, I'm not sure because these are politicians, we all know. Uh, they are elected. Uh, you can never anticipate how exactly this is going to end. Whether when we speak about home front command, uh, as well here, I can say that, and as I also said that, we don't have enough shelters here. Uh, in a state of mind, you know, most Israelis uh, in the north, not in the south, in the south they are prepared because they experience the rockets all the time. But in the north, we are not prepared for war. Okay, I, I put water bottles in my shelter at home only last week. Uh, connected to phone line and internet only last week. Okay, until that moment, I said, okay, okay, sera, sera. Uh, we live in kind of denial up here in the north. So just hearing all of that, have there been any positive advancements beyond the maritime border deal, which I, I know from your standpoint was arguably a form of appeasement that you know placated the situation, but we're hearing positive news out of the Gulf. We're seeing the Abraham Accords. We're seeing the Saudis at least entertaining the idea of actively engaging and not just sort of behind the scenes as the puppet master. Does this get a lot of good? A lot of yeah. good. I want to be an optimist here. I know there are things are not good, but no. where had the Abraham Accords remotely ameliorated anything going on vis-a-vis -vis Lebanon and Syria, if only bolstering a coalition together to, to combat Iran and its proxies? Or is that just no. what you're thinking? I think eventually it, it made us as Israelis feel, above all, the simple Israelis feel that we are not isolated, that we are not alone, that we have friends here that uh, understand the risks the same way we understand them, that are willing to uh, have economic projects with us. And that's why I've said that there are tons of good news because our transportation minister, not transportation, energy minister, it used to be transportation, uh, is now in the UAE or just came back from the UAE signing a huge project of energy provided to Jordan with the UAE involvement. This is amazing. Okay, it's truly amazing. We speak about Jordan and we speak about uh, the UAE. Uh, is this related to what is happening in Lebanon, Iraq, and Syria? Unfortunately, no, because in these three countries, there is still intense presence of Iran and its proxies and I don't see this change that quickly. People talked about the Israeli relationship with Iraq as well. It's not going to happen. Saudi Arabia, I think for me, again, publicly or not publicly, eventually things are happening. I understand the difficulties of Saudi Arabia. I understand the difficulties of Israel to agree to the terms of Saudi Arabia. Uh, but as you said, it's good news that there is willingness but I think all these countries understand that Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon are failed state that they need to manage the conflict with them or with Iran. The same as here. And and I ask, and, and again, maybe this is my naive optimism. Do you see any dynamic vis-a-vis -vis defunding UNIFIL coming from any of these Abraham Accords countries? Or is this an area that they don't want to touch? How do we sort of temper that UNIFIL funding? Because I imagine, diplomatically speaking, there are people who can pull those levers at the UN, even though that may not be applicable on the ground. Has that had any impact? I wish I didn't see until now a lack of willing to finance UNIFIL from any side. More than that, somebody told me, I asked, how come they are willing to send their forces? Why would they? They didn't prove to be effective. And I was told, not it's it's a symbol of prestige to be a member in this uh, in this force. But actually, there is no prestige. It's very frustrating. Even if you, even if you speak with the soldiers themselves, it's pretty frustrating to to serve them. Understood. Well, we leave you with that, Fred. I don't know if you're on the line. Possibly. Right okay. here. Right I'm going to turn to our co-chairman of CSA. You think, you think I would miss Sarit? <laughs> <laughs> 
Is there any question about why we've got this incredible participation today? Sari, I told you, first of all, we quell uh, at your success. I mean, I remember when we first met and you were just starting uh, uh, and, and what you have accomplished and what you have imparted to the world in terms of what's going on and arguably the most dangerous border in the world uh, has really been remarkable. So thank you. let me thank, uh, are, we, are we ready to close, Jennifer? I didn't know, I so we were a few minutes early, uh, but uh, if it's time, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank everybody who's on this call. Uh, we continue uh, to uh, uh, attempt to provide uh, the best source of information for everything going on in that part of the world, if you will, uh, to everyone who joins us. And we want to welcome you to come on any time uh, 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 to do that. Uh, Sarit, they don't, they don't get any better than Sarit, I can tell you that. But uh, uh, we discovered her long before she was a household name. And we're so thrilled to have you with us and your willingness to participate with us. Look forward to visiting the northern border while we're there with Sarit's team. Um, Sarit, I, I, I'm going to turn to you because I know this is a joint project with Alma and we have many Alma folks on the phone, but we invite the Alma community to continue to participate with CSA. We are thrilled to have uh, Sarit as a member and Alma, Alma as a member of the CSA Partnership Society. It's our first Israeli NGO that we've partnered with and we've been working with for a long time. And we're just excited to be here. So Sarit, I'll let you have the final word. Wow, I'm, I'm as excited as you are. And I, I want to tell everybody that uh, we have a platform of research that uh, touches upon uh, many topics uh, here in, in Syria and Lebanon, Iran, and uh, things that you ask the questions about. And I invite you all to enter to our website and subscribe to the newsletter. And uh, it's not too much, it's just weekly. Uh, and you can get a lot of information and insights uh, about what's going on here. So uh, it was a pleasure for me and I'm always honored to collaborate with the CSA.